I think San Francisco is, has always been a place that, that tries to bury its ghosts. And the ghosts are too recent to stay buried. Hello and welcome to episode 3 of the Who Cares Anyway podcast, and this time I'll spare you the introductory blather and just tell you that my guest is Trey Spruant. And Trey is a very special guest for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that he had a hand in several of the albums, records, CDs that got me started down this path way back in the late 90s when I was a college radio DJ. Uh, some of those albums would be the first couple of Secret Chiefs 3 albums on Amarillo Records, Mr. Bungle's Disco Volante, The Three Doctors, Back to Basics Live. Also, the early Neil Hamburger albums, which if you look at the uh, credits, you'll find that he is listed as producer on those. And then even the Great Phone Calls album, which he talks about a little bit here. Also, he was one of the very first people I interviewed when I first began working on this book or something resembling it back in 2005. And then even before that, way back in 2002, he was one of the very first people I interviewed for a feature article in my role as a writer for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. And that article, in turn, is maybe the very first one in a sort of unofficial series that kind of got the ball rolling uh, before I even had the idea of working on a book. Uh, so a big thank you to Trey for uh, not only doing this interview, but for all of his support over the years. Now, the idea for this interview was not to regurgitate or rehash what's already in the book, but rather to sort of connect what he is doing now or what he has been doing since, oh, 1995, with his experiences in San Francisco during the early 90s. And I should clarify that the Becky that he refers to early on in the interview is Becky or Rebecca Wilson, incidentally the female voice that you hear on the Great Phone Calls record, among many other uh, accomplishments of hers. With that said, I'll get out of the way and let us get on with the interview. Here it is. <laughs> How do you think of that those years in San Francisco and like that period in between the first and second Mr. Bungle albums when you were playing in so many other different bands and working with so many different personalities? Yeah, I mean, I, I liked how you characterized it. Um, well, what, one thing I think was really great is that you have Becky in there uh, prominently because she was really important to, I mean, not just you know, me meeting all those people that I ended up working a lot with and becoming really good friends with. But uh, yeah, she she was a real networker, like bringing all kinds of creative people together. Um, so my, you know, I was just sitting out there in the sunset. Mike Patton and myself were living in a house like way out in the fucking outer sunset. The only friend that we'd made was Smelly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, like, you know, he's no help when it comes to like, you know, uh, he, he's in a fight with everybody in the punk scene or whatever. So, and he, he, you know, he knew Grux and he liked Grux, but that's because he thought Grux was the person who had the most potential to be a serial killer out of everybody that he knew. <laughs> so l lucky for me, you know, when I, I started to get involved with Becky, you know, that's, I had met Greg at our house actually before, um, but it was really only after spending time with Becky that I start, started to spend time with Greg Turkington and with Grux and all of them. And things just really naturally blossomed from there. As far as me getting involved, I, you know, I was out of my depth meeting, dealing with them on a musical and artistic level. Like I, I felt like they were really nice to me. Like, um, I mean, it's whatever I was bringing into their world wasn't defined yet at all so I didn't really have any kind of a recording studio up and running at that point you know all of that sort of developed over time and so my honing my skills as like somebody who could capture things that were going on in recording was still kind of yet to come in the beginning there so in a way like I feel like my feeling for 
for having some facility recording music really did come out of wanting to capture some of these things that were happening, you know, that first that I was involved with and then after a while, just things that I was peripheral to, but I felt like should be, you know, should be recorded. I, that includes that fucking great phone call thing. Cause it, I actually remember uh, we went down to circuit city and bought a, a, a tape machine, not the one that we used at Becky's house, but the night before, cause we, there were two nights of recording. And the first night that we actually ended up recording it, which was, I think, the third night of the prank phone calls, it was like some machine. We just went to fucking Circuit City and went and bought. But that, that was like my first production gig was hitting the record <laughs> button on that shit. Yeah, it must have been coming out like fast and furious in terms of, you know, looking at what Amarillo was doing at that time, you know, they, you know, in, in 92, he had, you know, well, I mean, some people might scoff at this, but, you know, the, the zip code rapist album, great phone calls, the first facts head stuff, then you have, you know, let's say you've come off of, of the Mr. Bungle tours and you've got, uh, you've got, all, you know, your involvement in, in those different things. And then you, I guess it was a little later that you joined in with the Popo Pies. Well, the first, and, the first fact set is 1991 and it was oh, stomach, wow, okay. stomach ache records. It was pretty, pretty fucking early on 91 or 92, but at the, at the latest 92. Okay. And that was really the, f the first thing like a, a band that you did with, with those guys. Yes, for right. sure. For sure. And then, yeah, Plainfield was right around that time and Popo Pies and but I mean, I was involved with like, there was Bob Madigan and uh, his, you know, his bands that he was doing. And that was kind of a smelly connection, except Bob was totally around the Carolina scene and, and all of those people too. Was Bob another Michigan guy like Smelly or? or... Mm -hmm. His, he came from a band called Slaughterhouse, which was a really crazy kind of butthole surfers, but scarier type of thing. And then he had Boom and the Legion of Doom. I believe he was involved in that. And that's like, I, he was, Boom was another person who was around. Um, maybe not touching down too much in the scene that you were, you're covering, but he's a Michigan. There was definitely like a Michigan contingent. And it was Bob and Smelly and Boom. Do you think you would have wound up, I mean, sometimes people will speculate and say, well, and, and maybe I'm guilty of, of implying something like this, that, you know, if, if it hadn't been for Mike Patton and Faith No More, this other stuff wouldn't happen. But the thing is, you all were heading in some direction. And you, if you weren't going to end up on Warner Brothers and in San Francisco, you might have ended up, you probably wouldn't have stayed in Eureka forever. But right. did you ever ponder what um, uh, the element of chance involved in, in this, bringing you and meeting, you know, to, leading you to meet these people as opposed to wherever else you might have ended up? Yeah, I mean, it's so weird because you, you remember I had that uh, really old, I think, 1987 issue of the Wiring Department magazine, maybe 86, I don't know. 85 even, if, or I think that, that yearbook issue was 85. So, yeah, I mean, I had that up in Eureka, like when it came out. And the only band I knew in that was Faith No More because I had just seen them live with Mike. Um, you know, little did I know, like six years later, thumbing through it again like oh there's grux there's greg but you know there's all these other people that i've met since being down here and, um it was kind of a weird mid-80s premonition of all the people that i was going to end up playing with joe papa pie is in there too i i didn't know who any of those people were i didn't pay attention to any of the other articles in that magazine at the time but i mean mr bungles not, it's kind of tangential to everything in the fucking world it was i don't know that it ever would have found its home among those people to be honest like because yeah. you know trevor was in town danny was in town danny was doing some things but he never really crossed over too much into the world except for the papa pies a little bit but yeah i don't think mr bungle would have been really particularly accepted by that world is the number one thing <laughs> right you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's really a funny thing now to look back on that. It's very, it seems really strange that how turning the nose up was a was such a thing. But you know, it, it helped define things. I, the boundaries were quite good. I thought 
uh, for the time. Like I liked having a, a demarcation between, you know, I, I had a foot a little bit in the improv world and certainly in the Zorn sort of New York thing. And, you know, you couldn't have a crossover between that and like Grux land for sure. There was yeah. no, there was no conversation there, but it, this made me become like brothers actually with, there's one person who, who I think it is really parallel to my case, which would be Avon Kang. Cause up at, in Seattle, I mean, you, you, I, the way I see this with tangential to San Francisco, little fucking insulated scene. There was, yeah, the influx from Michigan, but there was Seattle, Seattle, Portland. There was definitely New Orleans and there was definitely Austin, Texas. Like this is okay. all kind of like a familial relations going on. Um, but up in Seattle, Avon was a lot like me, like a person who studied music and was, you know, had a lot of like musical literacy and all of this stuff, but then felt really small uh, standing next to people like the Sun City Girls who were, you know, gracious and welcoming to, to somebody like him. And, and then you just kind of find yourself as an artist going, you know, understanding that your what you value is a little bit different than what you've been taught as far as musical literacy goes or what you think being a fucking improv artist in New York City is. You know, it's just a, Avon and I are very parallel in dealing with this art world underground and then being, you know, wow. drawn into it in a, in a profound way. Yeah, th that world is a lot more comparable to academia in the sense that it was all about your resume and who you played with and, and there was a sense of like things being done correctly and a, a, a very dry I don't know some some feeling around it and whereas there's something a lot messier about you know the say the Sun City Girls and and that kind of thing and I, I noticed it the other night at the Phil Franklin or Sunburn show where you know they're tolerating a lot of wrong notes and mistakes and, and accidents, but it's in the, the course of possibly arriving at some other place where there there's, it's more open to, uh, you know, the, the magical kind of, kind of thing. And you, you got me to kind of reconsider Sun City Girls when I first talked to you, cause that would have been kind of spring 2002. Uh, the term you used was engineering coincidences. Yeah. Right. That's a whole different world. Uh, that, that's much more intuitive or, um, I don't really know what you would call it, but it's, it's, I think it's uh, fortunate <laughs> that you were able to, you know, Grux is, has, has that, uh, some, sure. comes from that, you know, we were talking about the new weird America, you, you know, Sun City Girls, uh, Carolina, stuff like the Sunburned, uh, Avon, it would all fit into that category. And, and it's not necessarily what you do in your own music that much, yeah. but it's a different way of, of looking at stuff. Uh, of of really approaching music than that yeah i would put it sort of like if you if you had to confine it within jazz let's say you know there there would be a there's really a difference between somebody like uh i mean even coltrane who's kind of a, a monster on every level but there's a real difference between somebody like coltrane and sun ra for example and the, the thing of Sun Ra is like, yeah, there could be a night where you went to see Sun Ra and be like, what the fuck is this? Like nothing came together, right? And there would be another time that you would go and it came together in a way that is irreducible, right? You know, so it's like you say, engineering of coincidences, some, you know, that those things aren't, um, you can't really engineer them, but if you create the environment for them to happen, if everything happens right, it's a different kind of improvisation. It isn't dependent on how much you practiced and how much you, you know, it's, it's dependent on completely like uh, extra musical things. So the musicians that open themselves up to things like that, you know, I would put Sun Ra and Grux kind of in the same category that way, because it's, it's conjuring something, you know, and it's conjuring something specific, but it's not something that reads on a musical literacy page, like really at all. Right, right. That that's that's exactly it, and that's where you know, say, Mr. Bungle is interesting that it, it, it attracts listeners from different places because I think 
you know, I've listened to Carl King, you know, he hears it in a very different way or appreciates very different aspects of it than, than I do. Yeah, no, he's, he's a very but kind of strict rationalist, but he's intrigued by things that are outside of all of his frames of references, which I wish everybody who had the, that rational ear had as much uh, attraction towards imagination as as he does, because most people who don't, like they, they just don't want to hear any, anything outside of that shit. You mentioned way back that um, and this might have even been in an email at some point, but that the most nervous you ever felt was uh, at a Three Doctors gig. Now, now maybe that has changed since then, but maybe it ties in with this same sort of idea that, you know, because you had the, uh, let's say the musical fundamentals and um, that kind of knowledge down. And I guess the idea is you're in this other environment where it's harder to prepare for. Yeah, because in a way that what it's about is musical personality, you know. You can't really, you can't really prepare much for that, for, for being in a moment. I mean, people, again, that's another cliche in improvised music, like being in the moment, listening, not playing, you know, listening and interacting. But in something like Three Doctors, it's yet another level removed from that because it isn't, the, the level of listening is actually the level of uh, personally engaging on, on, on extra musical levels as well, you know, or at least ex- expanded your, the idea of what, what music is at a Three Doctors show or a Bond Larvis show. <laughs> it's, it's pretty different, you know, than, I, I can't just call it role playing or any of that. Like you have to be able to go, it's more shamanic than fucking role playing. It's, it's more like what uh, like somebody like Arto would expect from an actor than like getting up there and playing a fucking character. To me, that's why it's intimidating. Nobody was taskmastering me like Arto, but I also feel like I'm standing next to these people who are, you know, sort of, in my estimations, giants. You know, they, they're Brandon and Greg, you know, even though they're the nicest people in the world to me and have always been nothing but welcoming, they still scare the fuck out of me. Same with the Sun City girls, you know? So that, sense of like I'm, I have to engage with them on this kind of collective project and hold my own as a as a personality and musical presence that's a lot fucking harder than rehearsing for a fucking gig let me tell you because you know you can rehearse for a month and get your shit together and you can be ready and feel good about it but with this kind of thing how the fuck do you do that I mean you can't yeah you know um, you said shamanic uh, Laura Allen said use the word uh, channeling when i i think i asked oh that was in a con- in the context of something about carolina uh but i think i asked i think the question was something to do with you know you know that some people would refer to these things as you know uh, cons you know costume bands or acting and then the idea of you know there's sometimes this fake binary between either, you know, you're authentic and you're singing about your emotions or you're acting and you're in a joke band. And I guess that earlier chapter I sent you had, had a lot of stuff about that. Yeah. Um, I love that. And it gets into these realms or these areas where, you know, thank goodness those, those interviews are not going to be aired in any audio setting. Cause I would be trying to articulate these questions and I'm sure you, you can probably relate cause I would fumble trip over my words trying to get into these areas where you're you're trying to ask a question and see if they understand where you're going but you're getting into these uh these areas where you know it's not something that you really see a lot of musicians or music type people talk about because you're talking about um levels or layers or or sort of uh the frame around what you're doing yeah, it's it's inhabiting like Carolina, I think, is the best example to use because it's, you know, those musicians were inhabiting a a world. They're not just dressing up in fucking costumes and like, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's way deeper than that. And and I think Lara mentioning channeling like. Even even the setting that Carolina puts itself in is like completely saturated with 
spiritism, like American spiritism at the turn of the century. And whether or not you know about that stuff historically, it's almost like you get introduced to it musically through this experience, through this weird time traveling experience. So just as a, as a spectator, you're drawn into it as a, as a world. You didn't have to sit there and construct it or read up about spiritism to know what was going on. I, I don't, to this day, don't know if that's what they're, what Grux is getting at, but the signs of this kind of American spiritist uh, realm or vortex opening up are unmistakable. That, that to me, Carolina is, is this giant psychic vortex of American spiritism, pure, purely. Yeah, there, there's also a, you know, a, a thread that, that kind of runs through. It's, it's sort of a, a sub-thread in the book, and it's not, you know, just bands and costumes and masks, but there is a, a certain theatrical aspect. And then, you know, you, of course, you have to mention the, the residents uh, went one way or the other, but there were also these 70s groups like the Angels of Light that were coming out of this weird in-between period, like post-hippie pre you know like glam era uh really mm. strange stuff and then that fed into tuxedo moon um and and that influenced factrix which gets into kind of the the um, that world that's you know like industrialish but there was still a theater aspect or and, you know they would definitely be uh, they were definitely into arto and, and stuff like that and then mm. you know grux would have picked up on at least some of this through you know through either through osmosis or not but you know in in that sense there's a, a sort of tra a tradition but at the same time you know it's kind of like whatever it is that makes san francisco kind of a, a hotbed or a, a place where that kind of thing evolves you can also get lots of other stuff that is just people dressing up in zany costumes and stuff <laughs> it's like, exactly it's exactly. just two sides of the coin or it's the uh, double-edged sword um but that's where that that turning your nose up and the demarcation kind of comes in because it, there is a fucking line between the things. But yeah, it's nothing you could. It wouldn't be. It's not an easy thing to demarcate through. Uh, I don't know. In from a social point of view, let's put it that way. It's it's rather antisocial in some ways. Um, and again, as an outsider to a lot of it, because I really was only inside of it by proxy, um, I can also say, you know, it, it, that all happened very unselfconsciously. Um, specifically in the example of Grux, like there was, he never talked about any of this stuff. He never gave anybody motivation that was a reference to any other precedents or anything like that. It was all coming, it's all pure pathos, like pure pathology, Gruxian pathology. Um, so that I, I often think of it that way too, is that maybe what demarcates some of this stuff from like, okay, we're going to dress up in costumes and the intensity of this pathology is, uh, I mean, you could almost say like, where does the schizophrenic line get drawn, right? It's how far, how far do you go down this road of um, assuming these different kinds of psychic states and expecting people to inhabit them pretty far. I mean, you know, it, it, that, I think that's how the line is drawn is just by how deeply people are willing to go down those roads. And they, they leave like the self-conscious part of dressing up in a costume way behind, like before they even get going on that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There, there were, you know, there are a lot of, not a lot, but there are, I don't know how else to refer to them because they are people, but they become characters. Uh, and, you know, Grux would be one. Uh, some of the people around Flipper in that world, Ricky Williams from the earlier era, Patrick Miller, uh, Minimal Man. You know, there's a great line from Patrick Miller that was um, in a zine, and I, I borrowed it and used it at the top of the chapter. But he basically said, you know, Minimal Man was this character I created. And he describes the character a little bit. And he says, for a couple of years, I... I basically became that character and was went on a really bad drug trip and and uh, and he was genuinely having you know hallucinations and several people told me stories about this but um you know there's a madness that that is almost like uh 
boy. I mean, the, that, that level of com kind of commitment or investment is not really something that a casual listener really has any right to expect, let alone demand. Yeah. And that's what it, the whole, the whole environment is saturated with that because of people who are around it, there's a lot of like questionable mental health, you know, just like people are right on the edge. A lot of the people who are participating or even just appreciating are, are pretty out there, you know, and it's not like a, not halfway there, but like all the way out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is the, um, you know, it's something about, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, chicken or egg, like how a place gets this reputation. Unless now here's something that you might be able to uh, enlighten me on is this idea of a situational not, excuse me, not situation, a symbolic geography, like, uh, you know, a place having a certain symbolic uh, value and, and, uh, or a symbolic quality. And then you mentioned, I remember this going way back to when California was coming out and you made a, uh, there was a post on one of the message boards and you, you were explaining a little bit about you know, the motivation behind it and Cali and, and, um, you know, so California has its own symbolic uh, sort of place in the, in the order of things, but San Francisco within that, I don't know, does that, does anything come to mind there as far as, you know, what, what does this place represent? Why is it a magnet for oh my these God. kinds of things? I'm a, I'm totally obsessed with that at this point. Um, I mean, I have my own thoughts on it, you know, that have to do with, you, you have yourself a terminal point of Western expansionism when you're hitting that golden gate, when you hit the Pacific Ocean, that's a wall. Um, and Western expansionism is something that begins arguably, you know, millennia before there's even European Western expansionism. So you, you have all of this kind of, almost like a gravitational pressure, but even just bringing it to the more recent history, you have an aspiration of creating an empire, the golden gate empire, um, like the United States interest was in making a conquest of the Pacific Ocean out of the Golden Gate. Um, so I don't know, there's almost like an Israel-Judah relationship between Northern and Southern California, uh, where you have a kind of a polytheism and a monotheism, uh, which is a whole other subject, but I, I, I think, I think San Francisco is, has always been a place that, that tries to bury its ghosts. And the ghosts are too recent to stay buried. The, the dark side of it, the bad things that are all rolled up in it are um, too hard to tuck away. So they end up haunting things that are happening in the present. Um, and I think there's a lot of that is just a lot of like this geographical, geopolitical compression, you know. But now we see playing out a lot more, I think, than, than we did even in the 90s. quote that I pulled out of Rene Ganon. Uh, he says, there's a very significant correspondence between the domination of the West and the end of a cycle. For the West is the place where the sun sets, that is to say where it arrives at the end of its daily journey, and where, according to Chinese symbolism, the ripe fruit falls to the foot of the tree. So this idea of some connection between a, the farthest point West and the end of something, and then Cali and California and the, the end of of, of something. And then, you know, you have the end times and on your 2004 album. And I think Bruce from Flipper talked about their music as the dance to the death at, at the end of the world. Mm -hmm. There's, there's some um, sense. And again, I, I could just be attributing too much to, to these people, mm -hmm. but I almost feel like I don't think so. th these characters were kind not characters, these musicians, artists uh, who were like almost intuiting or um, sensing some end of something that we don't really understand what it is. But I almost feel like the reason some of these guys went so crazy or, or um, kind of put themselves through the ringer with drugs or, or mental illness or whatever it was, is that maybe they're, they're the first ones sensing this 
whatever it is, but it's, it's appropriate that that's happening at playing itself out in, in San Francisco. Um, yeah, because I think that now you can see it as in the nineties, I certainly was seeing, um, for example, when you come to that and the Western wall, you know, West, if you start in California, instead of starting in Europe and your consciousness of the global coordinates, Japan is not to the, to the East. Japan is to the West. Oh, right. <laughs> and California is to the East of Japan, right? Where the Muslims talk about the sun rising in the West, to go back to one of the things you're talking about, that's uh, the day of, of apocalypse. It's the sun rising in, in the West. Uh, and in Japan, you know, the sun rises in the East over California. And when you think about the atomic bomb, it was, right, it was a different sun rising in the West. It was a very apocalyptic moment. And when, every time I see that rising sun image from that time in Japan, I was, you know, I mean, it's kind of stupid and trite, but associating it with this atomic bomb imagery as this limit that that Western civilization met when it hit the Pacific, all of that to me really like hit home when I went to Japan and with Fax Ted and we played with those noise bands like Masana, Merzbo, and Soulmania and uh, Otomo Yoshide and got so many, so much good stuff. But it was so strong that this idea of tonality disintegrating or tonality going through the second Viennese school, I mean, first being deconstructed by Wagner, being deconstructed more by the second Viennese school, being de deconstructed into a microtonality in the 50s and 60s, and then us having to sort of accustom ourselves to that and redefine our notions of beauty take on this whole sort of Nietzschean project of, of uh, acclimating ourselves to things that are totally dissonant, but trying to convince ourselves that it's a new sonority that's beautiful, all this kind of bullshit, you know? <laughs> and then you're ending up, I found myself ending up in Japan, like hearing mu music blown down to micro bits, just pure static at extreme volume. And no longer feeling like that process was had anywhere to go. Like the process of so-called deconstruction or tonality getting smaller and smaller was over, and it met this wall of static. You know, um, so for me, that that's actually in the '90s. That's when I started to. I mean, even and I doing NT fan and all of that stuff was really kind of all wrapped up in in that. Like our. Um, Maybe it was just me, I'm not sure. We never talked about any of this stuff. But, but yeah, I think that what happens is if you're sensitive to this kind of stuff, I'm only saying this stuff in retrospect. If you're sensitive to it, especially the people who became before, way before me or what we were doing in the 90s, it puts you in extreme, extreme alienation from the rest of, I mean, I don't even want to say society. like. Nobody wants to hear this stuff. Nobody wants to hear it from uh, a person because it's frightening. Uh, artistic things are supposed to give you sort of a, a different feeling other than being this confrontation with this uh, apocalyptic moment. <laughs> right. Especially one that, that might not be what it seems when it's this sunny California thing, right? And now we're talking about like transhumanism and Silicon Valley and the transformation of human right. beings out of being human, you know, you, you can easily see that that transformation is related to all of this. But bringing it up in these terms, it's like no one wants to hear it. So the way, the way, if you need to get it out there, the way you're going to put it out there is in this exaggerated way. There, there's really there's no way to convey that sense that you have building up because there is no. Uh, uh, vent for it there's no other place for you to put to put it if you have those sensitivities so it's that extreme alienation i think accounts for a lot of the broken personalities and stuff on, uh, on the road to this moment
you mentioned a word that I hadn't heard before. Uh, tetrico? How do you pronounce that? Oh, tetrico. It's, tetrico. it's Portu Portuguese. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that a is that a name for a genre, or is that a, what does that come from? Uh, no, it's just a, it's just a Portuguese word that means. Um, I mean, superficially, it means creepy, or you know, something that has okay. a quality of, of being haunting, but, but there's something foreboding about it. Um, but maybe a little bit more menacing than that. Yet it still has a kind of a uh, could pass for something beautiful, or you know, it's it's not okay. necessarily this pure menace. It's just, it's just like the the shadow of a menace type of thing. John Carpenter, Halloween, would that would that uh would that fit in that or? Yeah, I guess uh, maybe maybe it's a little less a little overt. less obvious, overt than that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, here's here. My my wife is is Brazilian. The best the, the she she always explains it as like uh, when she hears actually one of the Secret Chief songs reminds her of this, but she she brings this up every time she hears music that has this quality, which is like the music that you would imagine somebody who just killed somebody and they're driving away from from the murder scene and feeling good. Okay. But still, it's still like this, there's a still a, there's a mourning to it and there's a despondency to it, but it's also a freedom of some kind. Okay, but but then you you said that uh, there was an element of that on the that you hear an element of that on the the first Faith No More album, but that they got it from Tuxedo Moon, and I was uh, that's interesting. Where did where did you hear that? Did you hear that well, from Roddy? Or I I know that they listened to Tuxedo Moon. I don't know that they got it. I always thought that that music had that quality. It's what I loved about that first record. It's that very technical feeling of you know. Um, Somewhere along the line, I, I I think it was maybe Roddy made me some demo tapes when we I was working with him, and he had taped over like on the B side of it was Tuxedo Moon tapes. Oh, okay. So, something like that, something oblique like that. I'm like, oh, Tuxedo Moon, and that's where I first I think started hearing it. Maybe Grux had some Tuxedo Moon also. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because they they were. Faith No More and some of that stuff happening in the early mid eighties that has some of that, that gloom feeling, you know, it would, I could say, oh, there's a continuum between, you know, Tuxedo Moon or the sleepers and that. But honestly, in talking to them, a lot of what they were getting was coming from the UK. Uh, I think there's a certain affinity maybe between like the, the, the spaces, the climate, the, the, uh, the, 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 the fog, uh, the, the, the warehouses and stuff out in that part of town where they were rehearsing. Uh, yeah, for sure. And you can see it later in the early 90s when the rave music came over from England oh, to right. San Francisco, too. Yeah. yeah. Can you say a little bit about the the rave era? Like what um, your connection with that was as far as I guess you were mostly an observer? Just kind of. I, I'm glad that I stumbled into it as I did, because uh, I guess in a way it's a little bit just happenstance. Um, when Mike and I moved out of the, the outer sunset, I, I was just kind of living in my car. This was probably 1990. And I had a few friends from, from up here, like up in Humboldt, I'm in Humboldt right now, yeah. um, who were sometimes living in San Francisco. And they, they were, one of them had a girlfriend who was kind of important in the rave, rave scene. Um, like throwing the raves and knew all the DJs and knew all these British people and stuff. And uh, I ended up living at a house. The house that I lived in in San Francisco was essentially these like kind of early raver people. And um, yeah, this is, these are, that's a world that never crossed, right? Like this art world and the rave world. Definitely not. I was definitely um, in a bunch of different places simultaneously. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I, I went to a few of the, you know, I would go to these raves and maybe more importantly, I mean, what, what impressed me, what I liked about it was this idea that the music had become decentralized. There was no focus whatsoever on like the DJ wasn't even a thing. A DJ became a fucking thing after that, but it wasn't a thing at all. They would have their name. You might know who they are, but you don't know where, where in the building they are, you know, it's okay. just, just nebulous um 
ephemeral thing. And that was kind of fascinating to me. It's like, there's all these people together doing musical engagement with each other, but there's, there's no musicians and there's no focal point at all. And then I started to like talk to some people and try to understand their, the ethos or the mental mentality that was going on, which because I was like really interested in reading about things like nanotechnology and scientists, I had a, like a you know, small education in um, physics before that. You start talking to these people and they're talking about this stuff that turns into what we now recognize as transhumanism. And they're doing, they're taking like smart drugs and all this shit. <laughs> and they had fanzines. Like I've subscribed to this fanzines called Extropian, the Extropy movement, which turns out was run by, you know, people who became the, the most prominent transhumanists of today. I would go to like a weird rave and fucking somebody like uh, Terrence McKenna would be giving a speech over top of some shitty, you know, house music <laughs> or whatever. But, you know, it was interesting seeing all of this and seeing, seeing that culture and seeing the, the, the basically the Bay Area psychedelic uh, transformative psychology culture in, in that moment, because it's so relevant now as far as like being the backbone of uh, Silicon Valley, like the socio-religious fucking heartbeat of Silicon Valley. This, that, that stuff was the groundswell of all of that for sure. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't miss miss it, but you know, the only I would say musically, the only thing that really mattered to me was later on when drum and bass and that kind of stuff started coming along, and syncopated music started to to just lose, like the ear was accepting all these ridiculous, crazy time signatures, and you know, people were not so locked into the four four beat and everything. It started getting right. pretty interesting, like around ninety five, ninety four. Before that, musically, it was totally boring, of course. Yeah, you mentioned that you you were you kept wanting it to turn uh, to turn evil uh, the evil uh, techno, and uh, you you wanted to you you were dabbling not dabbling but experimenting with that, but it's like you got other stuff to do. You don't have to, the <laughs> as they I, would I say no, the the bandwidth to to make you evil techno or to make techno into what you wanted it to do. Yeah, now now it's been done pretty well by by some other people, so I'm happy about that. You know. Oh. I should get a list of recommendations, but, uh, but, the, yeah. but those experiments, uh, the, uh, there is a little bit in there, uh, a good bit in there about the, um, the Shotwell bomb factory days. And you now Danny told me a little bit too about that, that period of the Shotwell bomb factory, you were, you were basically living there and that's where you had your first studio. So, to, so to speak. Uh, Indeed. Yeah, that's true. I had, I had my ADATs like a, when I finally acquired ADATs, which I think it was 92, maybe 93. Yeah, that's it, all of that stuff went into to Shawa, which was Mike Patton's house. But he had, it was a compound of three different buildings and the second building was our studio. And he was generous enough to, to let me use it. I wasn't actually living there, except for when I was being a fucking bum living on the, the ground in the studio, which was quite a bit of the time in the beginning. <laughs> Okay, yeah, because D- Danny told me, or when I talked to him uh, about how you, you all, it was a lot of times the three of you, Trevor, Danny, and and you uh, would would often like convene. Let's say it, I don't know, maybe it's say nine or ten at night, and then go to the point of delirium and recorded all kinds of stuff that didn't necessarily make it. Uh, that wasn't necessarily meant to be a, a song or something that's going to go on the album, but just kind of led different places. Uh, necessarily i mean i i actually have a closet filled filled with adad tapes from that stuff and yeah like maybe uh 0.5 percent of that turned into music that was on disco volante but there's just mountains and mountains of stuff that we were doing is uh adat was a that was a really brief window of time where that was a format that um um, it was pretty significant. It was a, yeah, the, you remember it's like a video cassette and you could record uh, eight tracks onto a video cassette. But the, the, and the great thing, because, you know, before that, all we had was four track tape machines, or if you're lucky, you'd have like a, an eight track with reel to reel, but we didn't have any of that. The consumer product 
that gave you the ability to record eight tracks, do overdubbing at all was unbelievable in the early 90s. And the incredible thing is you could link them together. So you could have 16 or 24 tracks. Okay. And we, I ended up, I had 16 tracks from the beginning and um, started experimenting immediately. Um, and then, yeah, that's where like all of the, all of the music I was recording of all these other people was, you know, learning how to, how to engineer recordings, um, taking like some things that I've learned from, from real studio tracking, but then just tons and tons of experimentation. But with Trevor and Danny, it was, that was about capturing kind of collective improvs, Sun City Girls style. In fact, I remember talking to Scott Colburn, him giving me some really, really good pointers about how to, you, you essentially have to be ready. You can't fuck around with like setting up microphones and you're going to ruin the, the moment, you know? So you got to have something that's ready to go. Um, I kind of wired that studio so that it, it would be ready to go. It was also ADATs that allowed you to sort of map out uh, the recording of, of that album. Cause I mean, there's really no way, I don't think there's any way that that album could have been what it was if you didn't have uh, the ability to, to do that pre-production work. Uh, it, it, what, what happened was, is that because I had the ADATs, I had devised all of these ways to consolidate tracks. So by the time we were, we didn't use ADATs actually on Disco Volante, I don't think, but it was planned out. It was thought, it was conceived production wise, the way you would con conceive of it from a more limited ADAT setup. So we, we did, we had 48 analog tape tracks on that record, Wow! but there's, there's an awful lot more than that going on on the record because we stacked those tracks with a lot more information than you would traditionally do just because of like, you know, these ways that I figured out that you could mix, you could double duty on certain tracks. Now in California, that was taken to a completely insane level. And we did use ADATs on that, on that record. Disco Valentia was more, um, it was, I guess it was approached with a little bit more of a music concrete kind of uh, idea, at least as far as the, how the tracking would go, you know, and how, how things would get put together in the end. Yeah, the, you know, I, I, you know, coming back to that one and listening to it um, in light of all of the things that have gone on since then, as far as, you know, bands that are, uh, you know, interesting bands, but the idea of hearing an album that is so sort of saturated or with, with sound and information, um, a, there, there's a lot more of that, but in, a, in the Pro Tools uh, era or the whatever we call this era and it's almost I almost feel like it was good that there was a, a that it took as much ingenuity as it did to make an album like that because there <laughs> there wasn't you know, so much of it sometimes I listen to stuff and it's like maybe it would be good if it weren't as easy to record music so full of just saturation and uh that's not the the right terminology but information tracks stuff yeah uh, sure uh, but at the same time like making it when you made it, it that wasn't there were not other records that sounded like that at all at that time um whereas in, let's say in the era of secret chiefs again maybe it doesn't sound like that but you, there's a lot of other relatively many other groups or musicians making really densely orchestrated music that a would have been impossible in the era of, of four tracks or even a dats but b i don't know it doesn't have the same impact you know what or, it is yeah I, it, it you're you're right on it which is intention like you have to intend to do it there has to be concerted effort has to be coordinated everybody has to agree this is what we're going to do you can't fuck around and see what, what happens. There's none of that on Disco Volante. There's no fucking around seeing what's going to happen. It's all, we know exactly what we're going to do. And, you know, furthermore, we all are in agreement on what that should be. So that intention is honed before you even hit the record button. That, that's really what's different between, you know, about that 
era because you, you can't be casually throwing ideas out there. There's no such thing as that when you're working on, you know, analog tape and that's it. Right. You know what I mean? Like there's no, there's no, I mean, not to say there's no experimentation. There's, there is some, but you're, you, you know what you're doing and you, you mean it, you know, you, you have intended compositionally that very thing and not something else. I think with the when you have infinite amount of um, tracks or whatever bandwidth you can, and it's just you just pull up a a virtual instrument and try that out, and then try this out and try that out. It it takes all of that intentionality away. Everything becomes a, a matter of trying things until they work, which there's plenty of great things that come out of that too. But the intentionality part of it is gone at that point. Have you? struggled with any of that given that you know your recording uh your arc uh, creative arc has sort of followed the these changes in technology that for example allowed something like a forking path studio to to evolve you know i, I remember one of the albums says forking paths studio is a such and such power book with two mics and two preamps or something you basically saying that forking path studio is in a place it's 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 yeah a mobile uh, it's a studio without walls like a museum without walls a studio without exactly. walls and and um that was know, 1998 I think. yeah yeah and then you're able to so you're able to record with this musician over here this musician over here they're not necessarily in the same room um and that in turn really um you know reflects just a lot of changes in it parallels the way the world has changed. You know, here we are talking uh, over video. We couldn't have done this 20 years ago. So we're all kind of not in a place. We're all kind of becoming virtual, becoming digital. And I don't know, I'll just throw that out there. Like the challenges that come with that. Oh, no doubt. Like I, I would put the other factor, like if if we can, if we want to demarcate the, the real difference in process between something like, Mr. Bungle and Secret Chiefs, it's it's not just that, okay, now I can record. I, I might not have the whole band in the room. I can go up to Seattle and record Avent and then come, you know, go, I can go to them. It's the real question is why? Why do that? And the answer to that is that I'm spending two thousand dollars maybe on a Secret Chiefs record because that's all I have. And you know, this is where the glory of being on Warner Brothers Records comes in, because with, you know, with Mr. Bungle, we were all in the room and we did bring all of the musicians to us and we were in studios together. And that costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's the big difference there is, you know, the technology made, right. made me into a kind of a prosumer on the side when, when I'm doing low budget stuff with huge ambition. Um, but with the Mr. Bungle stuff, it's big budget stuff that's um, that all has to be sort of coordinated and it's much more of a human effort, like a human social effort. It's not really sustainable. I mean, it, it, in a sense, there was a fluke that allowed it to happen and you made the most of it is kind of a thing where. where... Yeah. yeah, there's no other way that, that the, those records would have been made that way. No fucking way. <laughs> I guess I'm always trying to figure out what the best approach is since it is, you know, it's, a, it's a matter of economics, pure and simple technology can help survival of certain musical approaches to doing music production. Um, it can, it can help you bring things to life that you wouldn't be able to do because you don't have a $200,000 budget. But that that's like where I'll, where it ends as far as saying something good about the technology. Like it, everything else about it since then has been a struggle to get. I mean, honestly, that like the Forking Path Studio with my CS60 and a Hammond organ and a couple 414s uh, is 
the best like it's, it's the, the fucking best setup and it's not an easy thing to get back to that when let, let's put it this way like the paradox of technology goes along and we're supposedly we're supposed to be expecting greater and greater things better speakers right our experience of listening to music should improve you have the hi-fi comes in the 50s 60s you get stereo goes from mono to stereo now everybody's got home hi-fi hi-fi systems everybody cares about what it sounds like it's a it's a super long story but just to to speed through a part of it somewhere along the line it became okay not just to listen back to music on like shitty computer desktop speakers but it became okay to listen to it on shitty laptop speakers and then it became okay to listen to it on a phone like through a little tiny hole or with earbuds like you know and those like the expectations have not been going up they have been going sharply down or at least the reality has been going sharply down and i would say the same for uh not so much for recording technology. I think all of this is human. I, I don't think it's about fucking recording. Recording technology is fine. Whether it's digital or analog, there's all these great merits to both. But the human psychological part of it is the part that's gotten fucked because we've somehow conditioned ourselves to be okay with, you know, also I think, it, you know, it goes to from the, from the analog source to the SD2 file to the WAV file, 16 bit or whatever, you know, down to the MP3 and bubble, you know, we're slowly like going down into a lot of streaming, like really shitty, starts to come back up a little bit where it's a luxury to have like a, a little bit better than an MP3. Um, all of these things are just downward spirals, but it's not, that's human. It's human expectation has gotten gone down. Maybe human, uh, Humans have gotten more conditioned to hearing robots making music too, or, you know, the robot content of, of music, um, which is not, you can't blame the robots for it. You can blame, like I told you, there's the economic factor, right? I might be musically literate, so I'm not going to have robots might write my fucking music. But to somebody who isn't musically literate, it's perfectly viable for them to get the program to have the robot provide the content like the chord changes and that kind of stuff right these things are all you know happening because of human decisions it's not really because the, the technology is at fault it's because humans are sort of at fault we're letting all of this all of our potentials go down the toilet <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is. but it it also um, you know, it, that technology that's enabled things to become distributed or decentralized, I'm, I'm using a lot of buzzwords here, but um, has, uh, I guess it's just gone hand in hand with the idea that a, a a scene or the place doesn't matter as much as it used to. And then in terms of like the kind of density of stuff happening in, in, a, in say, San Francisco of the early 90s or late 70s, early 80s, uh, it's hard to even conceive of, of something like that happening now. Even if San Francisco isn't the best example of like localism, because it's a, a kind of an international type place, uh, it's hard to even ma imagine a, a regionalism or, or localism being that kind of a factor that it was, uh, for good or bad. I don't know. I hear you so loud and clear. No, it's very true. And uh, I mean... I can tell you without any equivocation, like I have been, I've been so blessed. Like I hate to use that word, but <laughs> it's like we have, you know, I started here in Eureka with very close friends of mine who I'm still, you know, playing with now, but I had this, the time in San Francisco when such a scene did exist that I was able to touch down in. And then from there with Secret Chiefs, I've had my pick of like the greatest fucking musicians from all over at least this country, you know, and I've been able to put together all of these ensembles from all, you know, New York and Seattle and San Francisco, mostly Oakland, LA a little bit. Um, so I've been able to assemble my own sort of pseudo scene through the musicians and then go on tour and go all over the place and see, um, 
you know, audiences and musicians and that kind of thing all over the place. So it hasn't really like um, being decentralized hasn't affected me negatively. However, I am now absolutely to the point where I don't want to make, I mean, I'm not making the records that I'm making now, the recordings that I'm making now are not these piecemeal affairs that they have been for the last like 15 years or 20 years. Um, because now I'm entering into a period where I actually have, I won't say the means, but I have the will to bring musicians together. Um, and it's a little bit less expensive than it used to be to do that. So relying a little bit more on the actual human chemistry than on, like, I got really good at, at music production, you know, in the sense of when, when the, the magic is missing from a live show, finding a way to sort of put it back in there through a lot of complicated shenanigans. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. But that takes, that's the shit that takes years and years and years and years. But now I have like so much music, so much written and so much recorded. There's, there's A, no time and B, no will to wrap my hip arm around my head to bring a sandwich up to my face just to eat it. You know, I don't, I don't want to do waste all of that time because there's no fucking reason to anymore. Actually, the technology is better and I can bring people together and there can actually be human interaction again which the music benefits from greatly but yes the aughts was the worst fucking time for music universally and you know i i just feel like the i tried i did the late aughts is pretty particular late late aughts and i, I yeah. did my best to like make it through that period without financially collapsing and then a little bit after that you know for me the finance has just been getting worse and worse and worse and worse but trying to keep the music up to a certain level um thank god like i've made it through that now and i feel like i i'm really glad that i withheld most of the the music that's really close to me so that i can release it in the proper form now and like i'm sort of like whew, i made it through that fucking really really bad period with some records that are still okay you know they didn't get ruined too badly by the uh, by the processes of those times but it could be better than that that's for sure well here again is where the 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 strange aspect of time passing uh is maybe maybe a benefit uh in that i don't know we talked when we talked in 2002 you played we remember you playing in the car stereo some some stuff I mean, you were playing tapes uh or maybe they were cds i can't remember no, it, it was tapes. Tapes, tapes tapes okay but I, I, I'm quite sure that you played me music that hasn't come out. And I, I imagine it's still in progress. And, and only what's come out so far is just pieces of a, of a puzzle. Yeah. And um, mostly variations. Like the, the themes haven't come out yet, but the variations have, have come out. Right. And uh, so this has mostly been about the, the past. Um, but what can you tease as far as... Um, things that people can can expect or not expect hope for hope for there's i mean i've been saying for a while now the there's like a whole bunch of metal stuff um that's the stuff i'm overdue on because i promised it a long time ago but this is stuff that requires a choir it, it still has production stuff that has to be i have to get funding for basically um and as that's been coming together i've been finalizing a whole bunch of the other music which i'm actually i'm not going to say like what it is but it's not the metal um that's what i've been working on the most the last two years and now i've realized that no what what i really what i'm really doing here is getting all of the re releases up to a point where i mean to me simultaneity time time is si simultaneity I don't care whether something is old or new, like that has never fucking mattered to me. And the fact that I had like demo tapes from 2002, I mean, anybody can see, I, I actually document it pretty clearly. Like, you know, the whole time I've been releasing music that was written 20 years ago, 15 years ago. It's to me, it's like growing a vine, you know, having a, a, a wine aged the right amount before you really, put it out there and now it's sort of like I have a lot of different vintages that are getting there 
and the satellite bands are essentially the different categories of uh, musical inspirations that have been growing, you know, on those vines all of those times. And I've just been picking little pieces of them and putting them out there because this phase of Secret Chiefs, meaning the last 20 years, has really just been about making it a real band, touring. Like, to me, it's a proof of concept. Like, if you can actually do this music live and tour, we played like 750 fucking shows. It's not like a small amount of touring. And now I, I sort of put that aside a little bit. I mean, I'll probably, we probably will tour, but the focus in the last few years and certainly in the next few years is the releases, getting the records so that when I release something, then there's a reason to tour because there's a release and then I can do yet another release on top of that. So essentially just, you know, my goal now is once I release the first one, I won't stop releasing records uh, until I'm fucking dead, basically. <laughs> well, that's good. It's good to hear because I, I sometimes would get this uh, picture when I would I would sometimes go, let me see if there's any updates. I'd look at Web of Mimicry or something, and, and it's like, I wonder if I could picture you probably incorrectly, but, you know, up in, you know, because you don't live in the, the, the cabin anymore, but I could kind of picture you there spending forever on because there's just infinite possibilities with this technology as opposed to you know if you have a four track you just sometimes you just got to be done with it and, and uh how much of like the infinite can become a paralyzing or it might just be that there's just there's, that much music you're working on yeah there, there's been maybe a little bit of that on some of the record productions i've done but as far as like recent times when i've just sort of taken releases off the table um it's for a number of reasons. The number one being the amount, the avalanche, just the sheer quantity of, of music, getting them from skeletal, the skeletal point to putting some meat on their bones with recording to then refining them with performances and then finally mixing them. Um, I know for sure that you ha there, there needs to be a coherent plan for releasing and touring records. After touring so much, you know, there's a lot of squandered time or a lot of squandered effort that you can do when you when you tour without releases or if you release and don't tour i just realized like who am i like why should i feel pressure to put something out just to put something out no like yeah i have to build momentum again and the way to do that is to actually just put my head down and finish all this fucking music i can only imagine the the sort of uh like visualizations or the, the the flow charts or the diagrams that are that are kind of like you're sketch you're filling them in over time and uh, there's a certain yeah, they, amount of patience that has to go with that or um, yeah yeah and in a way it's like you're you know you start with one idea and you realize it isn't as good as it could be but it's not like I'm sitting there tweaking arbitrarily I think there's a very healthy interplay between um, you'll have a plan, but then, you know, a better musical idea will come and it needs a place. You know, that's maybe that's the most important thing in a way is instead of trying to force everything into this big overarching scheme, things come up in the meantime that are, that demand attention, that demand space. So those also often create their own uh, place in the scheme. So then the scheme has to be revised a little bit, but that's all a very natural process. You know, like to me, it's, that's kind of the easy and the fun part. Um, the flow charts are there. You're right about that. <laughs> but that, you know, I feel like that's just kind of personal creative stuff. It's nothing I have to bore anybody with. that are you know that they're virtual it, it reminds me of two things that um you connect to in different ways one of them is amarillo and and greg's 
way of doing these these bands or putting you know zip code rapist album has these fake albums on the back cover you know ask your record dealer for these or you look at the whole thing from the outside and you're like wait which of these are real people which of these aren't and you can't really tell which is which but then the other is um you know borges and and lim who you suggested to me and that style of writing um you know instead of having one writer write eight novels like he can take the idea for eight novels and write a review as if that existed. But that, um, I don't know. There's a, tr there's something there that I've always found really intriguing as a way again of for playing with these levels or, or layers. And so, so on. I'm so, yeah. so pleased to hear you say that. I mean, yeah. And, but the other, like there, there is another, yet another, aspect to it, which is okay they're virtual bands but i also just told you that secret jesus played 750 fucking shows yeah right? yeah yeah i mean so th there's a proof of concept here too like i'm not just dicking around making up phony bands it's right. the same as what you were talking about before about the costume rock thing like yeah if you think i'm just like making up fake bands some people see it that way and they say oh you know true just putting uses the sink it's not the same people it's not even it's not the same process even not album to album even song to song you know every song has its com a completely different process and a you know different set of recording <clears throat> even studios that went into them so everything is respected like musically each idea has its integrity that's respected the, the whole way through and i dare say meticulously crafted um so that those the virtualness of those bands it, it's it it is um it's it, it's essentially the ground floor of the idea you know it's really the basis of the whole the whole musical expression the same way um you know it the, the same way like a, a beam of light goes into a prism and comes out and six different colors you know each of those bands really is you know that color this color is this fucking band and that's because of these very very specific things that, that go along with it now i can't tour six different bands with those kinds of extreme differences that's not a practical impossibility but what's amazing is that i can find musicians that are malleable enough to be able to visit each of those kind of I mean, sometimes I have to teach people how to do certain tonalities or I have to, each musician is different. They have to have a, um, a pedagogy for how to understand some of the rhythms that are really strange. Um, so the social part of it is that actually these bands become real because I actually have to teach people how to do this stuff. And the net result, the end result at a live show of that is actual fucking live musicians, you know, in, interpreting all of that stuff in their own musical way and harmonizing together with it. So it actually ended up, ended up being the antithesis of a virtual thing. It actually became a very like social entity, which is strange to me, but it's the truth. Well, they, the, the ideas become real. It, it's uh, become like Talon, Ukbar, Orvis, Tertius, or the, the, uh, this thing is written about and then somehow it sort of in, it makes this incursion on reality where um, maybe it's my, one of the best metaphors for any of this kind of creativity is you know that there is an idea that then becomes real and whether it's um, you know the very first San Francisco punk band uh, crime I mean they made this single that really had no business existing that they really didn't you know, there's some funny stories about what the studio engineer thought when they're recording this thing in 1976 and putting out what is essentially a vanity pressing that now is worth hundreds wow. of dollars. And then it comes full circle to, um, you know, back to basics where, uh, as everything does, it, it you know, comes to, to back to basics. But, you know, we, Greg and Brandon telling me these stories about how they took copies of this LP and placed it in thrift stores. And so then you would have somebody around the country in some remote town so somebody could come across this record that is this kind of imagined vanity pressing and then that fictional thing becomes this real 
thing. And who knows what kind of ripple effect it's going to have in, in the same way that, you know, who knew what kind of ripple effect that this crime record would have as, as far as getting people to, you know, people would talk about how oh, they heard this record and it was so shitty. It was like, I, I realized I should, I could do a band, you know, the, the, or, or another example would be these, um, like the, the first song on the three doctors record that leaving has hurt that, that came from these tax write-off records that, that Greg wrote. <laughs> who the guy who wrote that song wanted to be a country and western songwriter or artist and he put this thing out there in some sense it, even if it wasn't uh it didn't come out in the way he expected copies got pressed left in a warehouse but somebody found it and then here here I am you know I come across this record and it leads me down this pathway and Russ Saul then, who, who uh, wrote "Leaving Is Hurt," you know, as a as a country and Western artist would be a failure. But here, here we are talking about this because, in a lot of ways, the, of the obsession that was sort of set in motion by that weird record. And so, uh, these ideas cause these ripple effects. So to call something virtual is not to to any kind of knock on it because it's like the idea starts and becomes real and manifests itself. And, and that's a very yeah. mysterious thing. It is. And, and even at the same time, it's people can still feel ripped off in the sense that, um, you know, a band is supposed to be like a bunch of guys, maybe a girl or two, you know, guys and girls get together, have, have some ideas, you know, share ideas, live, live a little bit of life together, you know, put out a record and, you know, like the whole, the whole romantic thing of then right. they go on tour and, they, you know, like I'm robbing everybody of that because that's not what any of this is, is that with the secret chiefs is zero of that. It's, it's a, com a composer basically putting, putting conceptual things together, but then leaving, um, since it has to be live music, genuinely speaking, there's no other way to do that than to actually create a fucking band. You know, right. otherwise it's really, 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 really boring, right? So that's that's what I mean, like uh, about there being paradoxes everywhere on it. Because I sort of like the idea of when when people feel cheated and think that Secret Chiefs is just this bullshit band because the satellite bands aren't really the bands that they appear to be. I just there's something that make that really makes me happy. Like I get fulfilled by that frustration for some reason. It makes me happy because it it's like a, I don't know if it's like a devious thing on my part. I don't think so. I think what it is is I resent the idea that that these things are supposed to be a certain way. And like when you go to a, a venue uh, and the house sound guy says, "Okay, guitar, drums, bass, vocal," you know, like he's expecting roots rock reggae guitar drum bass vocal something about frustrating that <laughs> is so good it's so good for the world it's not just good for me like getting off on defying it it's it's really good to break these stupid fucking crusts off like you, you know we end up with a gerontocracy until so you know somebody breaks these crusts apart and and i think that band the idea of a band could be so much more flexible than what it gets backed into is a, I don't know, the roman romanticized entity. Having been in real bands, I feel yeah. qualified to say this. You know, <laughs> real band. Yeah, no, that there was a, a quote. It might have been in one of the chapters I sent you, where where Brandon said, you know, people talk about a concept band. Well, a band is sort of a concept from the get go. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Couldn't uh, couldn't say it better. But yeah, there was so much of that. Um, a couple of different eras, but I'd say specifically in the late, in the early nineties, that they, this uh, really interrogating or playing with the idea of, of what, it, what a band is. And, and, uh, and I think it's time, it was timely in the sense that I mean, people might get upset with this, but in, in a sense that was kind of the end of the, the, the band era because mm -hmm. they're not, they're not as, it's not the, the kind of basic entity of, you know, the way music is done in, in the same way that writing letters is no more the, <laughs> the way people communicate, you know, or, uh, and, and, yeah. and virtuality takes all these weird forms. Like today I was at a store and I saw, uh, you know, like the, 
cards people give each other, like, you, you know, you're the best, or, you know, fuck you, girl. But this one had like a big, uh, a, like a lightning bolt on it and said, you're a rock star. <laughs> you know, and sometimes you hear this kind of shit, you know, or you hear people saying, like, you're a badass. And I'm like, well, I've been thinking that, you know, people being bullies and all of that is finally it's gotten through that being bullied, you know, bullies are assholes. You don't want to give them all the rope. But for some reason, it's like really great to be a badass. <laughs> and it's really great to be a rock star. You're a fucking rock star. Like, who's a rock star anymore? There's no fucking rock stars anywhere. What, what are they even talking about? That's a very yeah. strange one to me. Like, what is that ideal? That ideal is so far away from us now. Like, rock stars died a long, 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 long time ago. But as, as, soon, as soon as Dave Grohl became a rock star, that the idea of rock star itself had become obsolete, maybe. As it should have. Like, you know, I think maybe... I mean, big, no offense big, to him, because if it hadn't been him, it would have been somebody equally... Um, unremarkable as, as as such i mean great drummer but uh but and and i think a, a a positive force in in lots of things you know but yeah like probably secret chief's first record we got it about right uh when it said uh rock and roll is a thing that needs to die like 95 was that uh, yeah 96 yeah it's about uh, about the moment that it started to become more evident you know but the thing of, and that, that whole sentiment comes from like, you know, rock star. What is, what is all this? How can this be good? And I don't know, here we are 25 years later and it's on a card. Like you're a fucking rock star. <laughs> yeah. Like the pep talk, you know, it's got a, this weird hollow pep talk thing behind it. I, well, there, well, there's, you know, there's school of rock. And as much as I, I love seeing my nephews, uh, play you know getting into guitar and liking the same music that i listened to in high school which is kind of weird uh but but the idea of a school of rock for, for kids it's like well there's got to be something else then uh and who knows what it's going to look like or what it, what it'll what it'll sound like but i mean maybe is there a gg allen school of rock <laughs> See, I don't want them. I don't want them getting on that that path. <laughs> the, the one other thing I wanted to ask about, because this really would bring it completely full circle, because I put that quotation from the Zahir at the very front of the book. The Zahir being a, one of Borges's quasi-fictional stories that reads like nonfiction. Um, I, I was stretching it a little bit because he talks about this idea of maybe a kind of a disgust or re re sense of revolt at this coin, which, as you reminded me earlier, inadvertently, says NT on it. Mm. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, what does a here meant to you or whether my whether the the idea of something like a another uh disc like object an lp could could be uh could could be like a, interpreted as being something like a, a zahir this sort of thing that encapsulates this as he says uh what concatenation of causes and effects that that uh it's probably overstating it to say that that one record led to this but in, in a sense i'm thinking gosh you know this been, in a sense like half of my life i've been thinking about this idea i mean i i had some detours and times when i wasn't working on it but um i almost feel like i fell into this story the same way that some of his characters start investigating some phenomenon or something and then they kind of fall into the, the story and become like a, a a character but i don't know what what you saw in the zahir and what what um the impact was that, that had on you um the story you mean yeah what 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 was your t what is your interpretation of of the zahir and what it represents yeah i mean it's i always go back to the you know to the arabic the thing between the zahir and batini you know it's the two um two faces of the same 
coin, I suppose, because Zahir being the outer, the, the apparent covering on, on an interiority that for some reason seems to be obscured. So the, the esoteric interior, the Batini, as distinct from the Zahir, um, that the process of an unveiling or peeling the layers of the apparent back, um, like a, whether that's interpretation, I mean, that's what you would call a hermeneutic or an alchemy, it would be, you know, burning surfaces away. Uh, that process, yeah, that ongoing um, process, everlasting process, perhaps, maybe, you know, maybe there is no ending to it. Um, because there's always another surface, you know, there's always another, it, the, the next level down became apparent to you. Is, is that the ground of the whole question? You know, you're always burning these surfaces away. So I, I feel that, um, I don't know that, that, that Borges went to this point with the story actually, but there's a third term because the first term in the Arabic thing like the Zahiri um, has been associated at least in some Shiite esotericism has been associated with the uh, Sharia, you know, the law, the most apparent part of the um, of Islamic jurisprudence and this kind of thing. And then the Batini is associated with um, the esoterics, like the Sufis and this, this kind of thing um, called terikat. You know, it's like a path. It, means, it literally means a path. So like a walking walking a path from the exterior to the interior but the third term is the is the hak the hakikat and that's the the truth the the big like a, the, the the fulfillment of everything let's say but it's so surprising you know it's always so surprising what that is you can never really get to the to the kernel of that other than when you see what the sages have to say about that, it's always, it's always about how you esotericists got so full of yourselves thinking that you were getting to the essences of things that you never really, you didn't really get it until you realized that the law or the outer and most obvious part that you started with is the whole thing. You know, not that it's a paradox that led to nothing, but you had to go through the whole journey of seeing everything before you came back to that. Uh, and if you if you can't see that it's in the proper place, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> well, this makes me feel better about the the ending to the book, which I I won't uh, spoil, but. Um... Let's just say I was, uh, in lieu of a grand ending, there was an ending that was sort of, uh, let's say, in a sense, inconclusive. But I, I was also kind of mindful of the fact that I felt in some sense, and I don't know why, it's a completely unreasonable uh, feeling, but that, that somehow I was going to, you know, through this path, through this particular era of, of music and personalities and characters, you know, find you know, some kind of holy grail or, 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 or there was going to be something. And it was kind of like when we, we talked back in 2005 that um, we were talking about the unspeakable and sort of triangulating and, and the idea that, well, there's a reason these things are unspeakable and, and uh, in, in a, but you have to have something that you're kind of working with to try to, to get to it. And for me, it just so happened to be um, this odd world of music you know for someone else it could be maybe something else that could, could yeah. play the, the same role i don't want to make this book about like my quest for meaning or something like that but let's just say i was i was bouncing this idea off someone else and and uh he he had a very good reply that um without having read any of uh, studied any of what what you've studied almost sort of intuitively said something very similar in that uh yeah, it's the idea that you that that you peel away the layers, but you never really get to that. Um, I don't know. 
There's no way to say it that doesn't sound cheesy. Some kind of journey that didn't really have a destination. There's nothing wrong with the, with the cheesiness of it. Like, think of it this way. Think of what is it? What is a historian that doesn't get obsessed with something, right? They, they get obsessed with something and then they learn a bunch of things that are peripheral to, to the subject. If, if you get lost in all of those things that are peripheral to it, you, you become a competent historian and you can teach people about different periods of history. If you're somebody who has an insight about something, it usually means that you're obsessed with something and you're gonna keep going keep going down that 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 path i feel like you're a person who is sufficiently obsessed you know it's, it, to, so that insights become the your trade not not the ability to recite what happened here what happened there but you know insights about the importance of uh or lack thereof of the things <laughs> that you're seeing you know like I feel that you're you're a qualified commentator because of all of this obsession that you you've invested in this thing. Which at the beginning of it you weren't right. You know, at the beginning, no. Right. Well, uh, okay, and and I've been very fortunate that really the insights I think come from from uh, a lot of people rescuing me when when uh, like you have tonight. I I talk and I'm like, wait, I'm not sure I have a question, and they'll say. I think I see where you're going. And then they take it from there. And uh, one thing I will say on behalf of this whole, all the people that you've talked to is like, you know, at least the ones that I've encountered, they are definitely, the, the word mensch jumps in my mind all the time. Like there's so many menches. They're, they're the best people I've ever known, you know? So it's like, it makes sense. Oh, yeah. They save my ass like every step of the way. And, you know, and that's, Maybe that's part of the, the attraction or the allure here too, is you, 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 you're not dealing with a bunch of jerks. Yeah, no, you compare, compare the um, quality. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty direct way of saying it of the people I've talked to, you know, in the course of doing this versus uh, my versus uh, what I'd spent eight years in, in, uh, in graduate school academia around some very uh, high IQ people. And uh, in terms of, insight into the human condition or or or, or such uh, uh there's there's no comparison and uh it was kind of it was at the end of graduate school when i was i was finishing up and just feeling really like uh i'd been taken for a ride even if i took myself for that ride uh that i felt like you know the 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 way it crystallized in my mind was there's more wisdom in uh in a popo pies ep than there is in a whole shelf of these uh philosophy books and, and i you know i, I still kind of uh <laughs> i think i still think I, it's I'm true so, i'm so with you I, I, yeah so with you. even though even if they're going to be if people aren't going to be quite as upset about uh the space i give to the popo pies as they might be to the three doctors or how could you leave this band out but uh yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. You're, it's, you're it's, probably going to get a lot of that that stuff. <laughs> you didn't. It's definitely not not a record guide. It's not a. You sh you should listen to this record and this record and this record. It's really more. Uh, it's a really an exploration of these ideas through a lot of really extreme. No, not extreme, but extreme in a sense. But but um, really fully self actualized. Uh, I guess kind of kind of. You've had your your character. personal engagement with it, you know, which I think is. You shouldn't shortchange yourself and be like, you know, I don't want to make this all about my, but it is, you know, it is your personal engagement with it, which is what I'm trying to tell you is a value because of how fucking obsessive you are. <laughs> well, it was, if nothing else, it has been a great excuse to talk to a lot of uh, really interesting people. Thank you again to Trace Bruins for doing this interview. For all things Secret Chiefs and Trace Bruins related, go to webofmimicry.com. And to learn more about the book, go to headpress.com or whocaresanyway.online.